Good evening, and welcome to the Co-Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist. I'm again delighted to see you all here in person tonight and other attendees joining us on the live stream for the fifth session of our reflections on Lent and the events of Easter through art. Just would like to mention St. John's so kindly is organizing a cheese and wine reception following the last Lenten reflection next Thursday, March the 21st. So please plan to stay a little bit longer next week to meet and chat afterwards. And then also a quick reminder, please use the microphone when the time comes for us to explore the paintings. And tonight, Chris will help us facilitating the microphone. So let's get started. <clears throat> As usual, this slide has been updated to orientate tonight's works of art within the European artistic eras. All three of this evening's paintings were created within 50 years of each other. Our first painting is Tintoretto's largest and greatest work for the Scola Grande di San Rocco in Venice. Oopsie, sorry, I did something. <laughs> uh, no. Um. There's Brian. Brian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, slideshow. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> um, the crucifixion. It was painted in 1565 during the time of the late Renaissance with the influence of some mannerism. Our second painting is The Descent from the Cross by Peter Paul Rubens, one of the leading Flemish Baroque artists of his time. The painting was created between 1612 and 1614. Our third and last painting of this evening is The Dead Christ Mourned, completed circa 1604 during the early years of the Baroque painting by the Italian artist Annibale Caracci. These works will give us an opportunity to follow the stylistic changes occurring at the turn of the 17th century. So, going from the Renaissance into the Baroque. Before we begin, okay. before we begin to explore this evening's three paintings, to sharpen our eye and our understanding of the changes that were taken place in the artistic world, I will take a few minutes to talk about Baroque art and its distinguishing characteristics from Renaissance art. The term Baroque, derived from the Portuguese baroca, baroco, meaning irregular pearl or stone, describes a stylistically complex, sometimes contradictory era in art. In general, however, Baroque art desired to evoke emotions by appealing to the senses, often in dramatic ways. Baroque art originated in Rome during the period from circa 1590 to 1720 and embraced painting, sculpture, architecture, as well as music. And as you can see, I've 
specifically used um, the, the colors that kind of wash out. So because we can't understand periods of art as set. I mean, I use dates, but if you maybe Google it, you might find a year earlier or later. And they are not starting at one particular time. It's a, it's a process, and it happens in different countries at different times. So there's always there's a little bit of overlap, or you see uh, a little bit of a Baroque-ish element in paintings mixed with still the, the mannerism. But mannerism wasn't, as we talked about last week, not distributed all across Italy. For it was mostly focused in Rome and Florence. So this is a schematic, just to, to keep that in mind. So don't say, oh, this painting was painted in 1601, so it needs to be a completely Baroque painting. That does not, but just wanted to clarify that. After the idealism, idealism of the Renaissance, so Renaissance again, from roughly 1400 uh, to the end of 1600, but we have also the appearance of mannerism um, around 1520. And the slightly forced nature of mannerism, as say 1520, 1530 to 1600. And then we discussed the mannerism last week, so we kind of um, got an idea about the mannerism. Baroque art, above all, rejected the religious tension of the age. Notably, the resurgence of the Catholic Church in Rome, as it manifested at the Council of Trent in 1543 to 1563, reasserting itself in the wake of the Protestant Reformation. Thus, Baroque art is almost synonymous with the Catholic Counter Reformation art of the period. Often, Catholic-inspired Baroque art tended to be large-scale works of public art, such as monumental wall paintings and huge frescoes for the ceilings and vaults of palaces and churches. I will now highlight five of many aspects where Baroque artists rejected Renaissance convention they began to create art that projected movement rather than stillness, emotion rather than restraint, turbulence rather than stability, a sense of grandeur rather than serenity, and implemented the new techniques of tenebrism and chiaroscuro to enhance contrast and atmosphere rather than light across the whole work of art. To illustrate these differences, I have chosen two paintings and two sculptures, which we will see later, one of which was created in the Baroque and the other during the Renaissance period respectively. And then a side-by-side -side comparison of these works uh, roughly completed a hundred years apart from each other allow us to see and appreciate the five characteristics I have described of each art period. So on, on your left you see Gentilecci's uh, Baroque painting and on your right is Cranach's painting, painted during the Renaissance. Both of the paintings show the, the beheading of Holofernes. And if we now think of the five aspects that I was mentioning, so let's say um, movement. So, and I again like to use my lines. There is a lot of movement in the Baroque painting, and we have diagonals compared to the stillness in the Renaissance painting. The Renaissance artists like to use a triangular arrangement because it gave it stability. Um, we definitely have a lot of emotion 
in the Renaissance painting. I mean, it can't be more than this. These women are involved in what they're doing and they show their anger. We can't deny that. In comparison, well, she did the same thing. It was after the fact. She could just come over for a cup of tea. Um, it's like, okay, I just did that. Um, again, if you use the word turbulence, the blood is splattering here. Um, Holofernes is fighting back. So it's, we are in, in the moment in this, when the high, the, the, the greatest event of a whole story happens. And quite often the Renaissance used to depict the moment after the main event. Uh, grandeur, again, if you look, she is beautifully dressed during the Renaissance, no question, but the Baroque, we have even greater, vi more vivid colors. The women, the dresses are flowing, they're voluptuous, uh, so we have the grandeur. And the contrast, we talked about um, tenebrism and chiaroscuro, and using light and spotlight we beautiful in the Baroque painting. We have beautiful spotlight on the scene. We used, uh, Gentilevsky used light and shadow. Um, and then across the Renaissance painting, it's kind of all light. We have darkness. You could say, oh, well, they use tenebrism, but it's, it's not to highlight necessarily the event and give it three dimensionality, uh, which is the main characteristic of tenebrism. And similarly with sculptures. So we have a Baroque sculpture by Bernini and a Renaissance, a beautiful Renaissance sculpture by Michelangelo, both showing David, but so different again. Um, using my lines, the motion, uh, movement, uh, Bernini's David is twisting and turning. We have a beautiful triangular setting for the Renaissance um, David. Similarly, the emotion in the face. Um, he's focusing hard on the event. Again, it's showing the event when it happens. He's holding the rock in his hand and he's about to throw and he knows this is his only chance. He either hits it and he can overcome Goliath or the story will end in a different way. Um, so I think these pictures often say more than a thousand words. So I think that really makes it clear. They're both beautiful Renaissance and we, artists will often look back onto Renaissance art, but the Baroque was trying to m move forward and use mo emotion and motion um, to um, separate themselves from the Renaissance. So with this brief introduction of Baroque art, I now would like to turn over to our first work of art of this evening. Our first painting, Crucifixion, by the Venetian artist Tintoretto, created in 1565, is a large-scale wall painting for the meeting room of the Scola Grande di San Rocco a confraternity devoted to combating the plague, a repeated scourge of Venice. And as I introduce the artist, you can follow along on the handout. Jacopo Robusti, better known as Tintoretto, was born in 1518 and died at the age of 75 in 1549 in Venice. He's believed to have started an apprenticeship with Titian, but was dismissed after a brief period of time. No further records are available about his training, and he's surmised to have been self-taught through copying works of other artists, drawing from life, and even from dissecting corpses. Most of Tintoretto's paintings are large-scale narratives on canvas, animated by dramatic gestures and lighting. His art was characterized by the speed with which he painted and the daring inventiveness of his compositions. 
His paintings are notable of their rapid, broad brush strokes, their dynamism, their unconventional approach to the depiction of narrative scenes, particular biblical events. Tintoretto ran a large workshop in Venice. No one else came close to matching the sheer number of pictures he provided for Venice's churches, confraternities, government buildings, and private palaces. Tintoretto painted a series of more than 50 huge canvases for the Scola Grandi di San Rocco, which is the seat of the fraternity established by wealthy Venetian citizens in 1478. It is named after Saint Rocco, who is venerated in the Roman Catholic Church as a protector against the plague and other contagious diseases. Tintoretto's works for the Scuola Grande di San Rocco remain in their original location, including tonight's painting, Crucifixion. As you consider our first work of art of this evening, I will quote from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 15, verses 22, 24, 27, and 39, abbreviated. I quote, then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of a skull. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. And with him, and with him they crucified two bandits, one on his right and one on his left. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this was the son of God. End of quote. And now I would like to invite you um, on your comments. Um, and I, again, I chose a couple of areas that we can look at in, in more detail. And I decided to come back to another crucifixion. We, we, did, we, we talked about the crucifixion last week, uh, Grunewald, but it's, it was a more a symbolic depiction and very much focused just on Christ and, and the, on the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene. I think this is much more almost a historic depiction of how the crucifixion most likely had taken place with, with all the, the people in, involved in the, in the crucifixion itself. And so what do we see? I mean, what, what does your eye drawn towards um, when you look at this? Or is it just all theming, too, too much? <laughs> almost looks like you're in a stadium. Excuse me? It almost as it looks as if you're in a stadium with the people are up on either sides of it. Yeah, that's actually a really nice, the, the way the composition is organized. Um, we have kind of, uh, again, kind of lines, if you would draw lines, it kind of comes down here and it um, would meet here in the, in the center where we have um, a group of people on the, on the foot of the, the cross and it kind of comes here. Thank you. I just, I think I have a question, probably in, in the light of this period, all of the busyness, I mean, it's really exceptional with people and action and, uh, yeah. When I always think of the crucifixion as a little bit more of a private, you know, people sort of running away. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, that's a contrast. 
like it's too brutal or it's, I don't want to be incriminated, especially by Christ. So it's interesting that he creates this uh, action, people, a grandstand, sort mm -hmm. of. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I can't read here. So just to draw your attention to the size, this is huge. This is a, so I think one, re I mean, a couple of reasons. It, it was the end of the, the late Renaissance, and we, if we keep that in mind, the mannerism was um, going on in Rome. He's in Venice. So Venice never really, there was, mannerism was never really strong in Venice, but they were certainly exposed to it. And I think we can see a little bit of the mannerism in here. Um, the, the figures are a little, quite slender, a little bit taller maybe, and we see the, the glitzy colors still kind of popping out. Uh, um, and we, the kind of the shiny pinks and reds, um, and even the kind of this um, very shiny. So I think there's a little bit of influence of, of the mannerism. And then also um, throwing it slightly off center. So we don't have one focal point, but the artist has given equal weight to Christ, who's actually the most important, but also to all the peop other people. So there's no real distinction, except that he is set very high on the painting. Yes. And he also needed to fill the canvas. I mean, <laughs> lots of ways. Well, and, and there's so much motion all over and the Christ focus is very still and is at the apex of like the typical triangle of the, and that seems very typical scene from the paintings we've already seen where it's a triangle of the crucifixion. Yes. But then you have all the motion and hubbub around it. Yes, yeah. So again, he exactly, he, he was in that phase, he was trying out the little things, he was still using some of the Renaissance methods um, and yeah, the stillness of Christ, I think that's uh, one hallmark of the painting, the calmness and stillness of Christ amongst all the chaos. Um, partly from other people's comments too, but you know, there is the stillness of Christ, but this to me looks almost like a Roman spectacle. Like, you know, it's a public execution, which they like to pu publicize so that other people didn't make trouble. That was the purpose of it. but. Everything is moving. There are horses, large animals. There's everything happening. I mean, there's piles of clothes at the bottom. I'm mm -hmm. guessing that's the his garments that they're casting lots for. And, yep. And and the the witnesses are almost eclipsed by all this other motion around. I mean, the faithful are almost not apparent. You know, at the foot of the they're at the foot of the cross, which should be the focus of it, but. There's all this other stuff that's going on that's distracting from that because of the Roman spectacle that's underway, you know, and I'm sure a lot of these are the Jewish officials who are taunting Christ and things like that, you know, which are cited, but, you know, all that is really depicted in a very vivacious way. It's mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. It took me a while to see, uh, I, I'm seeing that they're putting up one of the um, criminals right. there on a yeah, and I have it Let's cross, and then I just noticed the other one is on the ground yet. Yeah, and they're putting, and it looks like someone's digging a hole to put the other there in the background is the other yeah yep, digging the hole for that criminal to be hung. Yes, exactly. So that's why I was um, using the quote from the Bible. It's. Until then, it was unusual to um, depict also the two thieves, but it's mentioned in all the four Gospels. So again, it, it was a good thing for Tintoretto to um, expand people on, the, on the, the canvas. And yes, exactly, so the, the one thief is already lifted up, and this we can see here, um, the second is just being put onto the cross. And just uh, so here are the, some of the people in there having the dice they're rolling the dice um, for the for um, the, clo the cloaks uh, of Jesus. Yes. I think around the time that this was done, like you said, it was 
uh, a response to the Reformation movements that were occurring in Europe. And I, I'm not sure, but I think um, it wasn't long uh, ago before the, his time that um, Constantinople uh, fell and uh, Venice was under the direction of, I think, the Doge, who lived forever, it seemed. And uh, Venice uh, was caught up in, and actually uh, didn't do well after the fall of Constantinople, and it was a, a downslide. So the confusion here is mirrored in the religious world as well as the uh, political world, I think, as, and it was picked up by him. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, exactly. So artists, as, as we talked about our last week as well, artists are not living in an isolation. They hear what's going on, they, they know what's expected from them. And again, these paintings are commissions. So most likely, the other people had their agenda, what they wanted to see on the paintings. Um, just to kind of come back, I think the depiction of Christ itself is is very spectacular. Um, we, we already commented on the stillness and the calmness, and even though we can see the nails, and his head is leaning forward, but it's not drooping. And also, there's a, a radiant light around Jesus Christ, um, which, again, radiates out of Christ and illuminates the space already ar around him. And then, yeah, so these are his followers. They're kind of huddled together. Uh, we have, we see the Virgin Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene, St. John, and others. So in the, um, in, the, in the Gospel of Mark, he mentioned that an, a group of women came up with him um, to Jerusalem, and so they're probably depicted in there as well. Um, And so, yeah, I think the, the person here digging, again, it's kind of, it's, it has multiple purposes in the painting. It, it creates energy, motion, and then having someone f um, have their back towards you, it's, it's kind of a new invention, but it, it's, uh, it pulls us in, into the painting as well. I think, we, we, I mean, we could dig there. And then also, just to kind of point this out, having the ladder, pointing out into our space as well, I think opens up the space and, and we could, I mean, this, this could be continue here. I mean, so we could be part of the space. I think that's a, and just Father Man, you, on when we do the Stations of the Cross on Fridays, you always point out the little basket with the, with the hammer and the nails. And here again, we, we, we see that, and some of the art historians have commented on that, that they bring along their, their basket, their work basket. That's unfortunately, the Romans had this worked out to a T. And unfortunately for many of the soldiers, that was what they would do many days in the week. And so they would get ready for work taking their basket with their nails and with their hammers. And so I, it just when I looked at that, it reminded me that you always point that out. Yeah. Um, any other, yeah? Actually, my first impression of the painting was Christ died for all of us. And, and I wonder if that was part of his reason for, for painting it like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Inviting everyone yeah, else, yes. Yeah. Yes. He also took, the, I think it's a cobalt blue, uh, and, and put it in such places yes. that carries the eye through the entire painting. Yes. We had a painting like that in the very beginning, and it was a green, remember it was green? And yeah, it was a courtyard. Yeah. Yes. Same, yeah. So again, same thing. Yes. So yeah. artists like to kind of use a, 
a s highlight color and then l leads our eye around the painting, mm -hmm. kind mm -hmm. of helps us to s take in the entire scene. Yes. And that fits perfectly with my summary. And I said, in Tintoretto's crucifixion, Christ is still and calm, observing the turmoil of the world underneath him. Tintoretto em emphasizes Christ's humility and mercy, as well as his communion with the ordinary sinner, the poor, and the destitute. So he died for all of us, yes. I will leave you with the question, where, amongst all these people at the crucifixion, am I? And now it's time to move on to our second work of art of this evening. It is the painting, The Descent from the Cross by Peter Paul Rubens, painted between 1512 and 1514. And yes, again, you can follow along on the handout. Rubens was born in 1577 in Siegen, a German province of Westphalia where his part Calvinist Flemish family had fled to escape religious persecution in Antwerp. In 1578, they moved to Cologne, which is my home city, where the artist lived until his return to Antwerp in 1589. By then, Rubens and his mother had reconverted to Catholicism and he remained a fervent believer until his death, death of gout at the age of 63 in 1640. Rubens was a classically educated humanist scholar and later in life also became a diplomat. He was knighted both by the King Philip IV of Spain and King Charles I of England. He was admitted to the Painters Guild in Antwerp in 1598. From 1600 until 1608, Rubens lived in Italy, intensely studying both the art of Greek and Roman antiquity and the great masters of the Renaissance. During this period, he also received commissions to create altarpieces, paintings for churches, and portraits of the nobility. After his return, Rubens facilitated one of the most important artistic workshops in Antwerp. Rubens' unique and immensely popular Baroque style emphasized movement, color, and grandeur, which followed the immediate dramatic artistic style promoted in the Counter-Reformation. Overall, more than 1,400 works of art have been attributed to him. Just to put the painting into context, context, the Descent from the Cross by Rubens is the central panel of a triptych which he painted for the Cathedral of Our Lady in Antwerp. The side panels depict the visitation here over to the left, and the presentation in the temple, here on the right. The altarpiece was commissioned by the Antwerp's Guild of Musketeers, whose patron saint was Saint Christopher, whose name means Christ bearer. Therefore, all involving scenes in the triptych show Chris Christ being carried or supported. It was Rubens' second altarpiece to be completed for the Cathedral of Our Lady in Antwerp. The first one was the elevation of the cross, which he painted in 1610, 1611. And we talked about this painting in our very first Lenten reflection in 2022. So we will focus on, the, on that middle panel and as we look at this painting, I will quote from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 15, verses 42, 43, and 46. I quote, When evening had come, Joseph of Arimathea, who himself waiting 
expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth. End of quote. And I would like to invite any thoughts, any comments? Michael goes right, good. <laughs> Who are the figures? How's the arrangement? What style are we looking at? Well, the, the thing that strikes me immediately is the, the mass, the weight of Christ's corpus. It's sagging down, it's being drawn down by gravity. The people underneath, that man in the red there, is that John? Are you know they're working to hold him up. I mean, they're, it's a dead body, you know, right. and it's sagging and it, it it's luminous. It's it's luminous as the white linen, but it's 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 you know it you can tell it's dead and it's lifeless. Right. So and they're depicting that that they're working at getting this mass of weight down and getting it settled and dealing with. Yes. Yeah, very much. I think uh, Rubens was able to depict the weight of the body. Absolutely, yes. I'm also struck just by um, like how there's several, a few ladders up that man in the upper left, my, um, my upper, yeah, my left, I mean, he doesn't have like a shirt on. It looks like he's almost like levitated, but he he's putting his weight on the cross. I guess I can see the ladder, but he's got a leg extended out. It looks like he's gonna fall or something. <laughs> um, yeah, and just how they're all grabbing. Yeah, it's hard to tell exactly where all the weight is right now and how much weight they're they're pulling on the cloth at the top there, but. I'm sure it's happening in a split second right now. That this, you know, this moment, mm -hmm. and that there's a yeah, there's a lot of movement. Yeah. And what is that in the corner right there? Yes. So this is a little um, basin, a little bowl, and I actually have it. Where does that? Oh. And and how some of the some of the blood is collected in here. In the crown of the hearts. thorn of. Uh, the, the crown of thorns and then s the nails that had been taken out mm -hmm. so that they could lower the body down. Um, and here, that's the, the sign that was on top of the cross. Oh, with the uh, rock on it? Where, where it said, um, mm -hmm. this is the, um, yeah, the king of the Jews. I just think that the colors are kind of expressing joy, which it's not a joyful situation, but they're just colors that are not drab and dreary. Mm -hmm. Very expressive, I mean, very full, very vivid colors. Yeah. So just yeah, it's a, it's a we are in the middle of the Baroque, actually kind of almost, um, Rubens might even tend to some, uh, again, classicism again. Uh, if we would do a side-by-side -side comparison with the um, elevation of the cross, we, we could pick out a couple, but it's, so it's very Baroque. So again, we have the diagonal composition of the figures, we have lots of movement, lots of twisting. Even Christ himself is in a very kind of twisted position. Um, so we have the movement. We have the colors to pull us in. Um, and we have the, the blood pouring out of Christ's side, out of, his, um, out of his wrist as they have removed the nails. Um, just wanted, this is, so Rubens was an incredible draftsman. Um, there are separate exhibitions where museums will d show even just Rubens drawings. They are absolutely beautiful. And I was looking through one of the catalogs and 
so he, he made a drawing very close to the painting um, with the different figures. Uh, and I think that's always beautiful to see how the artists developed the idea because with the, with the drawings they could erase things, move a, a body part to make it fit in a better way, to make it more expressive. Um, so I, I thought that was very neat. Um, and maybe <laughs> talking about the two figures, so they were, they were helpers um, and I thought that was a, a very intriguing way to depict this person and how he was helping. He was so involved, I mean he even placed uh, the linen cloth in, in between his teeth because he needed his hands to really help lord uh, the body of Christ. I think that's a, a, a peculiar but a, such a touching detail in this painting, I thought. And maybe just um, talk about the three p figures um, down at the, at the foot of the cross. Um, do we recognize some of the, the figures? You think it's Mary on the blue? Yes. And she's looking and wants to hold him. And then I don't know the other two women. Mm -hmm. So yes, so the ash-faced Virgin Mary really taking part in the suffering of her, s her, of her son. And then um, this is a Mary Magdalene, um, kind of more with the, with the open hair, even the other women have. Um, but it, um, because in the Bible there is the story that it was the unnamed woman that washed Jesus' feet and dried them with her hair. So Rubens placed his foot on her shoulder and it's hard to see, but a little bit of her hair is interlocked with his toe. And so that's kind of signifying her as being Mary Magdalene. I think he included the contemporary German uh, hair color here in the women. I don't think you would have seen blondes and most of them would have been covered. Um, I, I was um, looking at the background of the painting because I think the story as it goes, there was a terrible storm and uh, turbulence uh, and darkness that occurred. Yes. Yes, so the two comments, so one exactly, so we've mentioned that before, artists like to place biblical scenes into contemporary settings, dressing the, the, the figures in contemporary clothes so to make it more, um, more ac acute. So it wasn't, it's not a historic event that happened many times. It, it is something that happens year after year and it, it's part of my life. Um, yes, and yes, I love the, the background as well. Um, so yes, in the opening part of the of the gospel reading, it says it's it's in the evening, and it's a very particular evening, isn't it? It it's the it's the sunset, and it's the beginning of the Passover Saturday, um, Sabbath. So they really um, had to hurry uh, to take Christ off off the cross. The other baroque is the spotlight. I mean, you'd almost feel like there's like a headlight or something pointing right at him, yeah. Yes, yeah. And so beautifully with the light and then having the white linen cloth underneath, um, it brings out the, the body of Christ um, as really as the focal point um, in the picture. As I'm sitting here looking at it, it just speaks to me that he was, the artist was trying to make sure that people realized that he was for everyone because where Christ was born, I don't think anybody was blonde, but there is a blonde and a redhead right <laughs> in the lower part of the, the painting. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yes, wonderful. Just in terms of time, um, we have unfortunately have to move on. Um, 
And I, in my summary, the painting, The Descent from the Cross, created by Rubens, is a beautiful example which emphasizes the leading aspect of the Baroque with its focus on movement, color, and grandeur, and evoking the viewer's emotion. And I will leave you with the question, uh, do I have the strengths to leave my crosses behind and move forward? And tonight, I would like to end our reflection with the painting, The Death Christ Mourn, also known as The Three Marys by Anibali Karachi, painted circa 1604. Anibali Karachi, born in 1560 in Bologna, developed into one of the most admired painters of his time. And the vital force in the creation of the Baroque style. Anibali set out to transform Italian painting, rejecting the artificiality of mannerism. Together with his older brother, Agostino, and his cousin, Ludovico, each outstanding artists in their own rights, they were known as the Caraccis. The Karachi promoted a return from mannerism to a more naturalistic style, as formerly practiced in the High Renaissance, by artists such as Titian, Veronese, and Correggio. In pioneering a style that blended elements of naturalism and classicism, applying vivid Venetian coloring, the Karachi helped launch Bologna as a center of 17th century Baroque painting. The Karachi established an academy for, drying, for drawing in Bologna, with a particular emphasis on drawing from life and promoting draftsmanship. This allowed for the exploration of creative ideas in complex compositions. In 1595, Anibali was invited to work for the powerful Veronese family in Rome. There, his painting was transformed through his first-hand encounter with classical antiquity and the art of Michelangelo and Raphael. The Anibali Caracci fre frescoes on the ceiling of the Palazzo Veronese, now the French embassy, were lauded as the most glorious and influential ceiling decoration in Rome since Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, completed in 1512. In combining Northern Italian naturalism with the ide idealism of Roman painting, alongside Caravaggio, Annabelle created the foundation of Baroque art. So we kind of stepping just slightly back into the time when Baroque really started to take off. As you consider our third work of art of this evening, I will quote from the Gospel of St. John, chapter three, verse 16. And I quote, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life, end of quote. And now for the last time, so what do we see, um, kind of the style, diagonal? <laughs> Every painting has had somebody in a red dress and a blue dress and a green dress. <laughs> so is there a significance to that? Right, I think uh, it, there was a, a coat. So the Virgin Mary is usually dressed in blue, the kind of the heavenly color. Uh, we call her the, the queen of heaven. Red and also the like blonde or reddish hair is usually reserved for Mary Magdalene. And the green, 
is quite often used for Mary of Clopas. So she was the wife of Clopas, which is believed to have been Joseph's wife. Um, and then this might be Mary of Salome. So again, as I read in the Bible, there is a, a, a passage where it says, uh, the women that had followed Jesus around G Galilee came up with him to Jerusalem. So um, these might be the, the women that have come with him. I would just like to draw your attention if we just look at the Virgin Mary and the body of Christ. Um, kind of look at the hand the arm, um, the coloring of their skin. Just a very tender kind of moment. Yes, uh, yeah. I know that she, there's somebody else behind her holding her up. She's exactly, yeah. She is unconscious with with pain and grief, uh, and someone else is supporting her from behind. And I think Karachi made a particular point in echoing her hand with the hand of Christ, and, and then also her, her right hand kind of hanging down and hanging down. Um, the, the, the color are very similar. She truly takes part in his suffering. Um, he has died, she hasn't died, but just kind of coming back to what we've talked about yet last week, if a child of ours dies or a partner, we are alive. No, I mean, we, we die a hundred deaths with our children, and I think in particular this was after the crucifixion, before the resurrection, she probably knowing that the resurrection will come since she was part of the, of the big story, but still, it's, it's um, devastating. And I think Karaji really wanted to bring that across the, with have her positioning echoing the, the position of Christ and also using this, the very pale color. And even her, the color of their lips um, are almost the same. I think this, uh, this identification of Christ minimizes the, um, the brutality of the nail holes in the feet and hands, and we barely see um, where he was stabbed in the right side. So I think the artist really wanted us to feel the emotion of the intensity of this and not focus on, like the previous mm -hmm. um, painting that we had, and I'm blanking on who it was that had such Could a, know what? Mm -hmm. yeah, such a brutal, brutal uh, depiction of the uh, damage that was done to his, his body. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of that comparison, I think you said that Grunewald had um, hand scream or screaming hands, and this one is like mourning hands, you know, the two figures to the right with, with their hands outstretched um, kind of just de de depicts a different emotion than that painting did. Yes, beautiful. It, it, it often strikes me at the time after the crucifixion, it seems like this, the absence of his buddies and the absence of the male followers. Yeah. Yes, and I'm, I'm trying to put something together for actually for the beginning of next week. When artists make that choice, to what do I depict and how I do depict? Do I go for the beauty? And is that, and is that how I invoke um, 
compassion with the suffering of Christ, or do I go for the, the ugliness and the gore? And, and different artists choose differently. And I think also we, as the viewer, respond differently to, to that choosing. Um, some people rather lean to the beautiful, and that's enough, because it's, it's, the beauty is so stunning in to think what did we do to Jesus Christ, our King. Um, and others n kind of need more the, the, the reality of the event to help them to get into the, the, the moment of the, the realizing the passion of what we have done to Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, um, and so yeah, the, just following up on the hand gestures, I think that's too, the, the artist really try to give each of the individual figures a particular expression. So um, Mary Magdalene holding the hands up in, in, sh in shock, veiling. Um, Mary of Clopas probably being there to help. I mean, she's another, so um, Mary Solomon, she's supporting Mar Mar the Virgin Mary, but we need more help. Um, overcome the situation. Uh, so I think that's a, a beautiful scene. And then again, the vivid colors and to connect this lecture back to the beginning. So this was 1601. Um, Karaji wanted to walk away from the mannerism. Um, he looked back at some of the work of Michelangelo, of the, of the kind of again, going back to the, the beauty but having the elements of the Baroque, having diagonals in there, having the vivid colors, having the flowing clothes in there, so the, the, so the, the grandeur in, in it as well, and evoking emotion and, and calling us uh, to participate in, in the passion of Christ. Yes. Oh. <laughs> no, absolutely, we have time. <laughs> I'm just fascinated by the, the Marys who have the little halo and that they must have been, looks like each of them have a halo over their heads. Oh yes, that's and right. That yep. must have meant they were especially pleased. <laughs> <laughs> and halos come and go out of fashion. So um, the, again, it might also be a, a particular interest of the artist that sometimes they, and, but also they go out of fashion in certain periods of time. Yes, thank you very much. And um, our time is up and I will leave you with this closing sentence in, in my last question. The Virgin Mary was always there for Jesus Christ, even in the ter most terrible moments. Will I understand in times of suffering, like Mary, that Christ will be with me through, through it all. Thank you very much.